Perfect. So, welcome, Mr. Bolter. Thank you very much for your time and for uh, uh, agreeing to have this talk on uh, yeah, how managers of multinational corporations might respond to the uh, coronavirus virus induced uh, crisis or you explain to me and to us uh, afterwards how much of a crisis it actually is. But as a starting point and before we talk about these issues, could you give and explain some background about Bloom, the corporation uh, you are leading together with others uh, and also what's, what's your job in, uh, yeah, in steering uh, this corporation? Well, my pleasure. First of all, wonderful good morning, Mr. Dobush as well. And um, yeah, talking about Bloom, um, this is a company that has been founded in 1952. And our founder, Julius Bloom, he was a blacksmith by trade. And his first product actually was uh, producing horseshoe studs. So obviously at some point in time, he was running out of horses and had to think about doing something else. Um, many, many years later, meanwhile, uh, we are leading manufacturer uh, worldwide in the furniture fittings industry, if you like. So what we basically producing is hinge, runner, box, lift systems, including all the services going around with it. Uh, or if I would say it in a different way, it's kind of everything that's moving in your kitchen or in your living room, except the human beings. Uh, the more it is from us, the better for us. So that's a little bit where we're about. We're talking uh, nowadays about 8,000 people worldwide. And our headquarters are in Vorarlberg, right at the border to Germany and Switzerland. And we do have 6,000 people roughly working uh, in that area. And the other 2,000 more or less spread all over the world in uh, more than 30 subsidiaries and also of course working together with close um, distributors or uh, people in the industry. Furthermore, what's maybe interesting to know to frame this whole interview a little bit is that uh, we have uh, three main production places mm -hmm. uh, outside, uh, outside of Austria. So that's on the one hand side in the US and uh, the second one is in Brazil. And there's another one in Poland. And currently we are just about building a new, an additional one in China that's uh, just about started. So that's from the production side. Uh, yeah, maybe a number to close this part off. We talking about 1.8, roughly 1.8 billion turnover in our last fiscal year. So my role in this company part, there will be a second one, is I'm part of the managing, the management board. And uh, we are in the, just about in the third generation of the family. And that's probably the most important message. We are a family owned company still. And of course that has a lot, this has lots to do uh, how we can deal with the crisis as well. Mm -hmm. And my second role we have within, <clears throat> in, within this whole company conglomerate, we've got uh, a consultancy firm, if you like. So it's called Bloom International Consulting, which, I'm, which I have been founding uh, in 2004. And in brief, uh, we are responsible for the entire personnel, organizational and corporate development for the entire Bloom Group worldwide. I have a team, we have a team of 20 people sitting right here in the headquarters and of course some uh, satellite experts being in, depending on the size of the, of the subsidiaries that you are working for us. Yeah, maybe, so maybe that's in rough what it is. Maybe can I, uh, two minor questions. Uh, when I read up uh, on the company before our talk, I. I found that the first subsidiary had been founded in the US uh, and only, and for example, Germany, where close neighbor only followed suit. So do you happen to know what is the reason? And, and the second thing is because we talked about that briefly uh, before um, our recording, uh, you are not a member of the Bloom family. Uh, and you said that's uh, not uh, something new, but this has always been the case that while being family owned and also family run to some degree, there have also been outside um, top management uh, team members. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I could explain your first question from a funny side. Mm -hmm. Why is it not Germany? Why is it uh, the US or further abroad? Uh, you might expect a super intelligent answer. The answer is very simple. Uh, it is since we sit right at the corner of the three countries, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, uh, of course, the, the German speaking countries were our first focus outside of Austria. But since the language is and was key at those times, that's exactly why we kind of managed them from here and did not found a subsidiary. So how we spread around the world uh, is actually along more or less along the language skills. Mm -hmm. If we found in, in the country somebody that spoke German in those times, bear in mind we're talking about the post-World War years, uh, that is how we could communicate. That is mm -hmm. how we started the business. And if someone felt like this is my topic, this is what I'm burning for, that's how it started. Mm -hmm. So also our, um, our the first crew in the US actually were all Austrian Oh, really? uh, origin. So that's in a, in a nutshell what it is. Second question um, about the family. I think this is one of the, the, the remarkable points in this company, the family. And that started with the, the founder. Mm -hmm. They always felt the one thing is the family part, but we do know that we have certain strengths, but also some weaknesses. And from the beginning, they always tried to add their core management team with expertise in fields where they were maybe not as strong. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning up today, that's still the same thing. So we're just about in the third generation now. We prepared that for the last 10 to 15 years almost already. Okay. And um, yeah, I had the privilege to... to accompany the older or the second generation to be politically correct as well as now trained the third generation to a certain degree helped with a lot of other experts and colleagues and now um yeah the third generation is in charge and probably two of the of the older ones or more experienced ones help them uh together with our top management team i mean that is mm -hmm. It's not about a person, it's always about a team. Mm -hmm. We will hear more of that later on. Okay, so then let's uh, jump into the main reason why we are Zooming and, uh, today, particularly because Vorarlberg would be quite close to Innsbruck. Uh, so I would have also invited you into a lecture and we have, could have recorded a lecture, but uh, that's something that's not possible uh, currently nowadays. Um, due to the corona situation, you mentioned that in a family-owned business, you are usually you're used to planning for the long term. Uh, so as you just uh, explained the long term plans of management succession, um, which I would say some publicly owned company and publicly traded company could only dream about. Um, but then uh, the Corona crisis was compared to that quite sudden. Uh, and uh, yeah, so my first and introductory question would be how and uh, in what ways is Bloom affected by Corona, for example, in terms of sales, supply chain, production, what are the Corona hotspots at Bloom? And yeah, and how are you dealing with them? Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind if I uh, f f rephrase your, your question a wee bit, because uh, I, I would be, I would feel much better if I could talk about the past, but I would like to clearly say, uh, we are in the middle of this crisis, if not even at the beginning, mm -hmm. especially when we're talking about organizational consequences out of it. Um, I always try to explain it a little bit like this. It's, it's like the, um, the health issue about the whole crisis is not even over yet. But of course, as we can tell already, it's closely followed, if, not, if, if there's an overlap, by the economic crisis. And uh, not even, I would I don't even imagine what the social part will be or at the end, maybe even the political part of the crisis. So we are in the middle of all these problems. And that's also why I agree to give you that interview because I think that's particularly interesting because um, as anybody else, I can't see the future, nobody can. And I can just share what we, 
what we're suffering mm -hmm. right now, as many others listening here as well, and they all know. Um, I think it's, <clears throat> and that was one of the biggest challenges, especially in the beginning, to explain a little bit the, the character of this crisis, because at least for me, and probably for most of the people, this is the first time in a lifetime that I have been confronted with a life-threatening crisis on the one hand side, and on the other, that uh, the whole world was actually touched by. A lot of people ask me what's the comparison to the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and I think that's a, a major difference to it. So people are scared to hell uh, to not say they panic quite often. And I'm not going into a theoretical uh, uh, explanation here, but that does have complete different rules going along with it. That's on the one hand side. So we were confronted with, or we are confronted with people that are scared, that are uh, scared for their lives. And on the second side, our main responsibility from a business standpoint is to save the people's jobs. So these kind of, these two things are kind of contradictory every once in a while, or they at least seem to be. And uh, if, you, if you just follow how all the rules that came in kind of overnight, and we are not any different than any other personal company in the world. Uh, it all started with those signs from China. And me, myself, to be very honest with you, I thought, oh yeah, this is this, this flu, they're making a big fuss about it. Um, it changed gradually. We went through all those stages we all know what change does to people, starting with uh, uh, denial and then uh, hope it's not gonna be that way and then getting angry and frustrated and, and all those things. And when it finally, uh, finally, when it came to, or when the, vi the coronavirus came to Italy and it came closer, uh, well, then we woke up as well. And uh, I mean, maybe that's a bit embarrassing, but uh, uh, telling you my true story myself, we actually had uh, an international conference uh, running here in Austria. This is a program we are running once a year. And all our, uh, lots of our key people from the subsidiaries were all here for this weekly training. Mm -hmm. It's a program three times a week. And that was the opening week. Mm -hmm. So that was when it already was in China and a few little things in Italy, which we didn't really know all about. Mm -hmm. So we had all these people fly in started this this program i was conducting it on monday and tuesday and was expected and actually finally left uh, on tu tuesday evening i flew to sydney australia for a three weeks trip and i remember at midday uh the owner of the company called me because we were the three of us and said well do you really think it's smart that all three of you leave maybe it would be better to have keep one here because we're not sure what's going to happen. I said, okay, that's fine. That's then two of us leave. Um, yeah. And I keep that story short. I finally arrived in Sydney uh, with a good jet lag in my head, uh, worked all day. And then in the evening when we sat together for dinner, the, the one that was not sitting was me because I was constantly on the phone with Europe, be it Austria, be it Belgium, be it whatever. And all of a sudden it exploded. So within two days, we had to make the decision to turn around and still was hesitant because I had my, my little holiday after my working thing waiting for me in New Zealand. Uh, so it wasn't nice to say, okay, but it was clear. I worked day and night, the day down under the night for Europe and turned around. And the following Monday with a second jet lag in my head, we, we landed here. And ever since it's 24 seven Corona. Um, so that's how it hit us. And um, yeah, so that's maybe to frame it a bit, little bit. So it's this disbelief on the one side, the immediacy of the whole thing. And <clears throat> if I try to answer your questions uh, from the different fields in the business, if I start with the market and uh, maybe with the market and the customer side, 
<clears throat> then um, as I just explained, we were confronted more or less exactly the way how the coronavirus spread around the world. So the China, the China thing was kind of, yeah, it's far away. Uh, then of course, as we all know, the Europe afterwards, then the America still being in complete denial and kind of last but not least down under because they were a bit uh, predicted. And that was, that was for me personally, uh, a funny experience because I was actually sitting in Sydney having um, everything being normal whereas they panic at home and I kind of still still being a bit in the bile to be honest with you kind of thought what the hell are they what's the, what's the problem down there well I understood quite quickly um, <clears throat> the biggest problem from the market side is that we just couldn't get any reliable prospects, no forecasts, no nothing. We just didn't know what it meant. And, <clears throat> um, you know, on the one hand side, China, Japan or whatever, Asia going up already or being okay, at least they got went down a little. It was a coincidence or not that it was kind of combined with Chinese New Year, if you like. So we were not hit that strongly at the beginning or didn't know what's the reason why is it because they extensively enjoy uh, their Chinese New Year or is it is it really the effect of the virus and um, yeah that is still today exactly the same thing it's unpredictable we it's it feels like trying to read the crystal ball or asking the oracle and if I come to, uh, if I hit, I touched the logistics side already. So uh, that is one of the learnings actually we had because all our systems in place, call it forecasting, call it planning uh, of material, everything, they are fine and they streamline and effective under normal circumstances. But very quickly we found uh, well, we can watch, we can look into the, the screen, but uh, what we see there uh, is definitely not what we probably will expect. So we had in a very short amount of time to, to find different approaches. What helped us here definitely is uh, our culture. So we immediately uh, got together quite close, well, I'm not talking about the distance we had to keep, but quite close. And we were capable in a very short amount of time in our dialogue oriented culture to really organize the things. I think that is a huge advantage that we had. And it's based on the year long culture we constantly developed in the good times. So that's certainly a benefit we have. Maybe, maybe one, yep, yeah, sorry. No, no. If I go to the product service side, maybe quickly, because I, I would, you said you were able to quickly do the things and, and, you know, and you had to organize very quickly. Could you give an example what specifically you did? So what, what are the first measures that you take in that situation? Because I expect uh, the problems are on all parts of business. So you don't know uh, what the forecast will be. This has consequences for whether you halt production, whether you apply for um, Kurzarbeit, meaning, you know, um, uh, reduced working hours for your employees. So what were the first steps that you took specifically? Yeah, the, f um, the first step we took is actually we built an immediate task force for the situation. And that task force was, of course, the majority uh, of the top management. Um, I'm saying I'm coming back to that immediately why I'm saying the majority. Basically, it was everyone, but with limitations. Then uh, communication specialists, then really we installed immediately a hotline for all of um, our employees for whatever questions they had. Um, and then of course, a few experts that did the analysis and analyzed the data day by day, try to compare, etc. So we had people working all of a sudden 200%, where others literally were sent home and being closed in at home wanting to work but not being allowed to work but that's more that's another thing why i did say and that was a specific challenge for us uh almost the whole top management and and that was the scary thing about it because 
day by day, we didn't know who had to stay home due to um, quarantine, et cetera, from ourselves. And we had a few in the top management that had to stay at home, no matter if they were infected themselves or because it's a family member or they were in contact with someone. So immediately, and that's probably uh, what, what I mean when I said we, it worked quite quickly in the beginning. Every morning we had our a meeting with the task force, the top management, some on Teams or whatever the, the, the tools are that we were using every morning. And then we took what was there, exchanged immediately. And that was the key, I guess, because we had to make decisions based on assumptions. Uh, but then the dialogue helped. And, and that is I, one of my most important messages. All the tools can do a lot, but it's based on the trust and the dialogue quality that is in the company. And there we were quite fortunate, I would dare to say. And that still works. And that lasted, the task force lasted a few weeks until later on only, we decided to go on short, uh, short time, uh, working short time, et cetera. And then we reduced it at a certain time when it was clear that the majority of the people need to stay at home to a core team of six, seven people. And we had every morning we had our stand up meeting. And for me personally, as, as um, tiring that time was, to me personally, that was the, the little motivational factor every morning, just stand together see the others suffer or smile as well, whatever the situation was. Sometimes it took a few minutes and the spread of tasks, sometimes in 10 minutes, we had it clear. In normal times, it would have taken us weeks probably to get those things solved. And within no time we had, that needs to be done. Let's do it, meet again at, I don't know, one o'clock PM or whatever, and then see where we are by then. And uh, that was an emotional, motivational element that helped to bridge those crazy times. Yeah. So that was in the very beginning. Does that uh, answer your question? Is that? Uh, no, you, that that's the task force. I think is very, very important thing. And that, but you mentioned in the beginning that we are currently still in the midst of the crisis. Uh, but you already, you, the task force is not in full force anymore in operation. So uh, how, what's the current status? So what is the, uh, how do, what, what parts are already back to some kind of new normal maybe? Uh, what, is, what is still in crisis mode? How many of your employees, have the, are your employees already returned to work, most of them, or are most of them still uh, with reduced working hours? Have you, laid, had, to, have you had to lay, lay off people? And maybe also, what are the differences with regard to the subsidiaries? So, um, so for example, you, you mentioned that you were building a plant in China, but it's not uh, in, in full effect right now, I suppose. So yeah, maybe, so what, what's the status quo? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, maybe I start with that. The, the status quo is that we had to give the people a certain orientation. How much can, should we work? Because if I quickly give you an example, how we are in a situation where we have on the one hand side, a production running, a production under normal circumstances is running in three shifts. And then we, of course, have all the other departments as well. But by, by nature, the production depends much more direct on the incoming orders, et cetera, et cetera. So their work load is, that has a direct impact on what's coming in. So furthermore, we have different countries in the world that ask for different elements and kind of products. So China and Asia running at full speed, whereas Europe was kind of shut down and, and Amer the America still thinking has nothing to do with us. So it had an immediate impact on the production. We had lines running 15, 16 shifts and the lines beside were kind of stand standing still. So <clears throat> that to deal with this, and that's maybe a strength and a weakness 
of ours that we try always to be fair with everyone, uh, but fair and treating equally is not or treating equally is not necessarily fair. Uh, and all of a sudden we had those disbalances all over the company. And I just took the, the example of the production. Of course, this has a ripple effect throughout the whole company and all the others. So what we did, we tried to lay a balance, an orientation balance for the entire company to not have it strict and mandatory. And we started with a 50% orientation. We said, we try to orientate ourselves around 50% in com complete awareness that some departments run much higher where others, for instance, uh, central services like that, that are responsible for flying schedules and stuff like that, that had almost nothing to do, to find a balance throughout the company. And that was important on the one hand side to get some orientation, on the other, it was uh, a disadvantage because some people take it too serious, say, no, I'm allowed to work, work 50%. So we actually, um, um, we adapted this orientation just about two weeks ago now. And we said, okay, now we try to get up towards 80, maybe 200%. And then again, this means the whole company with the prioritized projects that we have uh, needs to adapt again. So that's why I'm always saying we are not, I'm happy if we're in the middle of the crisis. I don't believe so personally. And the whole follow-up consequences for the organizational setup uh, are still in the midst of it and that's still to come. But you mentioned also in the beginning that this uh, Corona crisis is different from the world financial crisis is 2009, uh, 2008, 2009. But I suppose um, also then uh, your company was affected, uh, be it just by the economic downturn uh, the crisis uh, led to. So what is, what is different, except that it's much more sudden, it has become much, uh, been much more sudden. Um, could you identify key differences also in your uh, in yourself handling the crisis or, or what what your strategy currently is for for working through the crisis mm. i mean the fact that we have to work short uh short term in our company that's the first time in our history we never had to do that before uh you also asked before if we had to lay off people no we didn't lay off anyone so far and hope we don't have to and so the same thing was in 2008 um if I could describe it maybe this way, 208, yeah, the insecurity was high too. But I would describe it more than like a V crisis. It dropped down quite quickly, but we were capable to recover in an overseeable amount of time. Where this time, I do not know how long the bathtub is going to be until it's going up and it will be a slight comeback to the new normal, whatever the new normal is going to be like. Um, what helped us always, and this is again, this is an investment that you do in, in good times, not during the crisis. During the crisis, you have to function. But in good times, we have a high, developed always a high standards in training and in flexibility of the workforce. So in 2008, we were capable to have even experts working on being specialized on certain uh, processes or certain procedures uh, to shift them to other fields where the, where the demand of the product still was there. Uh, this we do now too, but since the crisis is going to take much longer and with all this uncertainty, uh, what we actually try to and we, what we did, I'll give you two examples of that in a minute, is that we try to as much as we can i know it's theory but we try to do it to act anti-cyclic as much as we can so um two examples maybe in that concern i take the most the, the probably the, the biggest hot spot so that's the financial side uh <clears throat> we decided that's also uh, two weeks ago we decided to compensate the people's loss of income to a 
an almost as, as high as we could for those three months, talking about April, May, and June. That's what's overseeable at the moment. And that's where we started our short term, uh, where we are working on the short term conditions to compensate it, to avoid that people in those three months uh, get completely trapped in their personal, private, financial <clears throat> challenges. So how is it possible to do that? You're safe in good times and you have it in those times. And as I said in the beginning, one of the most important messages is we are family owned uh, company. So we really put the money aside for difficult times. And now we, we reinvest it into our people. How does it look in autumn? How does it keep going? Again, I'm not the Oracle, I don't know. Uh, quite honestly, I'm, I'm pretty tense, especially towards September, October, because then we will feel what it really did to, especially the countries that were more in the second or third row of being infected. Um, yeah, we take it day by day, if not hour by hour. It has stabilized a little, which probably stable, sta to use the term stable in those terms is probably the worst you can, but I think you know what I'm talking about. So it's, it's going in waves. Um, and where I see one of the biggest challenges that we are facing, and that's what I, and my fear is especially because I feel lots of people underestimate it completely. The first phase to, to shut the company kind of down uh, was terrible, followed and accompanied by disbelief, as I explained before. But at the same time, you know, that the crisis systems got in place right away. So it was quite a lit uh, by politicians, by leaders, blah, blah, blah. It was quite an organized thing to do. But now we are in, in the down, on the downside, and the challenge is all of a sudden we need self-responsibility, we need uh, team orientation, all those kind of things. And that based on this panic kind of flaw we created. So to bring the company up to speed again is going to be a great challenge to find the bridge between what was happening and what we're going to need. And I could give you the second example. Uh, one of my favorite topics is the home office effect. We were in a very fortunate situation that we started it in a project called My Work at Bloom two years before the crisis came to really prepare uh, our people for those, a good mixture of home office, uh, let's call it in brief, uh, different working models the future. So we were quite prepared also on the system side. So people were equipped. But now we had people that were kind of, uh, had to, to, to use their holiday hours and blah, 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 uh, for weeks we have people that were kind of uh, suffering the new, the new situations at home, uh, all being teachers all of a sudden and all the, the elements we know. And we had some, they are or we have some, they're completely exhausted because they have been working like crazy for now, almost two, three months now in a row. So all these people need to come together again. And I'm 100% convinced most of the people or the company responsible think, okay, it's a, it's a comeback thing and it will go on. No, the new normal needs to be conceptually uh, organized. And especially, and I stick to my little favorite topic here with the home office. Uh, there's lots of beautiful things we have learned in this short amount of time. Quick decisions, all those tools we were thrown in cold, ice cold water and were kind of pushed to learn to deal with those things. And a lot of things we learn from it, and that's great, and we will keep probably a few of those, but uh, that does never replace the social, uh, the social contact. And the, the importance of the team atmosphere and all those elements that needs help now from the responsible leaders, in my opinion. And 
I, ca I call it, uh, I just call it this weekend, said to my wife, I have a new favorite term, it's onboarding with home office. Uh, and that's what I mean is we need to define how does home office look like in the new world and not just because it's easy for IT, for instance, IT people to work from home factually, uh, that doesn't mean that this is going to work. It needs different things as well. And that has to do with our understanding, how we understand performance. Most of the, sorry. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just want to reinforce this issue because I, I think it's uh, very interesting. Uh, first of all, that you started uh, in advance with the home office preparations, uh, so to speak. But I also, and you mentioned it before, and that um, you put an emphasis on, on fairness. And, and I know from other cases that I did research on or consulted with is that they have problems in terms of that some people uh, want home office but uh, are not trusted to do so, others uh, are not able to do home office, others don't want home office at all, so you have all these different preferences. Um, so what is, so during crisis, okay, this, this is not a problem because you cannot do work, uh, at least many people cannot do work in the office, but you said you want to keep some things, but you have to conceptually organize the new normal. And uh, so what, what, you, what do you want to keep? What needs to further change? And maybe expand a little bit on what you mean with performance measurement, because I think that's also something that might make also a company then, yeah, made force companies to develop new performance measurement tools. Uh, what's what's uh, the situation here at Bloom? Yeah. I mean, in all fairness, I'm more than happy to share how we do it. But in all fairness to all the companies that maybe are not in that preferred situation that we are. And I, I, I underline it again. It's it needs the measurements you take, in my opinion, they should be in line with the culture that's there. As more contradictory element you have to the culture the more it creates fear and uncertainty. And that's exactly the opposite of what we need. Or in very blunt and short terms, I strongly believe uh, if you get what is the uniqueness or what's the core of the company's culture and you align the tools that you're installing as close to that, no matter what it is, be it on a, be it an employee development dialogue or be it a, a team tool approach or whatever, if the culture and if the, the philosophy of the company is seen and felt by the people in those tools, then you probably do a good job in focusing and, and have at the end the good performance. So maybe I share what our performance definition is at Bloom. Uh, and I always say it's, it's four elements how we define performance. Uh, I start with the most obvious one and the one that ha everyone has. Uh, so, because I don't have to talk about that a lot. And that's the task, the, the things you need to do orientation. Huh? From the task side, you need to, you need to have goals. You need, you have milestones, et cetera, et cetera. That's everyone knows, but especially in a corporate world, this is the orientation that is more or less overlapping a lot of the other elements. So we dared and we communicate that uh, actively in the whole world that this is one part of it. And the other three are, number one is we've got a cultural responsibility. So what is our culture? What are our values? Each and every employee is the carrier of those values. We can write nice sentences uh, in nice framed pictures that doesn't help a thing if people don't feel it. Or in other words, it's important that they understand that they are in the way they do things, not just what they do, we had that with the task, in the way they do things, they are the ambassador of our culture. They are the carriers of our future, uh, and that is an important element. That was two. Number three is the individual. So we have a long-term oriented uh, philosophy. So if, if that's not just uh, lip service, if you really mean it, uh, in an environmental context, you will probably talk about sustainable, 
but the same is true for the individual. So if we, if we cry for a lack, or we cry because of a lack of experts, you see, I often say, we should ask ourselves, what, what did we wrong to not get them? Or if I want to keep them, that's probably the more important thing, if I have them, I have to take in account what the individual situation is and how it uh, can be developed long-term in the future. And that definitely is not just short-term success or quick wins only. So that was number three. And the fourth element is the team aspect. Uh, and I'm not going to the home office again, but the team element is how do we work together? All those collaborative elements you cannot do it just on your own in my opinion so the sheer fact of being present or not present what does it do to the atmosphere in the teams and since we have a strong dialogue oriented approachable culture that element has a certain value long story short and bringing back to your question uh, no matter how you see those elements in in your company, but I, I see it as crucial that you try to clarify it, that you communicate it to the people so they have the chance to get an orientation to in what direction do we go? What is this company like? And I mean, it, it, always if we talk about money, people understand it immediately. And uh, lots of the students will probably think this guy is crazy, but I tell our applicants the first, before they even come, I always tell them, if you are up to maximize your income, if that's your goal, that's a fair goal, if that's your value, go for it. We are the right, wrong company for you because we have this whole system laid out different. But what you get instead, and if you're happy to listen, I'm more than happy to, to, to explain it to you. That's exactly what I've been telling now. <clears throat> And um, now, now you have to help me. But that you asked about the performance, the performance approach. But, but how do you? Uh, I, I I get these uh, four parts uh, of performance. But I, you know, I, I how do you? Performance and performance measurement uh, is uh, is tightly intertwined. And we know that the way you measure performance always has an influence on performance. And so, so there's no neutral way of measuring it. And if I would want to challenge you, I would say, I <laughs> completely agree that you believe that. But the problem in, in practice is, <laughs> is oftentimes, you can easily measure whether a task has been fulfilled easily, more or less easily, easily and whether it was um, fulfilled in, in a sensible amount of time and, and whether it was accurate and, and, and so on. But it's much harder uh, to, to, to measure or to foster uh, how people live their values or whether they are, yeah, whether they work as a, uh, in a team in a productive yeah. manner. And, and so how do you do that? Yeah. I perfectly agree with you. It's a, that's the lot of extra miles you have to go. Absolutely. And you can not measure factually to the second digital after the comma certain things. So that means you have to develop different tools or different approaches. And I, I, I answer that question with where we actually started with the question about the home office. Um, what we did is we, we, made every employee go through an assessment about himself or herself. That means assess your personal situation in regards of this challenge. So start like, what is the tasks that you have to perform? I mean, we don't have to argue if someone that works at the stamping machine is not taking a stamping machine home for home office. That's an unarguable point. But what is the tasks that you're responsible and you're looking for? Second, on the individual side, uh, how, what's your working style? How do you prefer working? Are you someone that is uh, probably easy uh, to focus and concentrate no matter if I have a lot of people around or am I the, the opposite? On the individual side, talking about home office, what's, what's the situation at home? Three little kids crawling around my legs, uh, or do I have the circumstances that I can 
perfectly focus and do what I need to do. And third, on the team level. So we did an assessment on all those levels I was referring to. And then on top of that, we said we keep a open, transparent diary in our team, in all the teams, for learning reasons. So we started that people had in the first phase, a uh, probation phase, if you like, when they tried and they were allowed to try it out, they were kind of writing a diary about those times. And it was transparent in the team because it needs to be learned in a team. It's not just, yeah, it's cool, I can do home office or I cannot. But that's exactly what I try to say. You need to conceptualize this a little. And then we had team dialogues together to discuss it. How is it and how we go about it? What was missing, what was not? Team dialogue on the on team level to... or across teams? So team dialogue Could... on the team level or across teams? I, I, I missed the beginning of your question. Could you please repeat that? A team dialogue meaning within teams or also across teams? Both. In, the entire, in teams where it started and then we shared it. There was a huge pilot project and we shared it across the whole company. And in stages, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I really like the idea of the diaries, but maybe that's because I'm very much into blogging. I also did a, <laughs> I also did a research project on two companies that were very public in their blogging about their strategies and, and actually used this tool of, they were young ventures as kind of an impression management strategy. Um, so, so I'm interested in these, these blogs. You said they were transparent on the team level, where they're also transparent to superiors or, or to all in the company or just so i'm really interested in a little bit in the specifics also regarding the assessment you said it was a self-assessment but has there been some some you know maybe anonymized uh, you know evaluation of the assessments overall do you happen to know now how the majority of your employees are feeling about the situation so and and, and maybe add some tiny technical things so did you use a survey tool how did you do that now I'm running into danger to, to be cut off in a minute. <laughs> um, I'm completely, no, I shouldn't say that to a professor, but I'm very critical with um, all those surveys and all those kind of things. And I'm even more critical about intransparency. I am a strong believer that <clears throat> What we actually should achieve is to strengthen the self-responsibility within the people. I do believe that this is the base of, a, of all those concepts that are appearing, be it shared leadership or shared aspects, etc. That only works well if we develop and educate people to be capable to deal with it. Same is true with the, 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 the transparency. A lot of people think complete transparency is the right thing. I'm, I'm absolutely do not agree with that. It's about to find the optimal transparency and the optimal transparency is as much as the people you want to develop can deal with. So having said that, uh, in the, those assessment, yes, at first step, the first step was doing a self assessment because that helps to increase the self-responsibility and even more important, the awareness of what am I actually asking for or what am I really wanting to, which is not always a nice question to answer yourself. Second, uh, the managers, the, the second question you have, they are employees as well. So they did exactly the same thing. We said, everyone does it. It's not done just the employees and then some uh, managers at another level uh, judge it without the experience. So if you, if you want to have a functioning system installed, you need to develop all participants. So I can tell you, I was suffering for a year uh, because all of a sudden the dynamic changed completely. And I was reading those diaries as well. And I'm not going to tell you how many times I got angry uh, when I read certain things, but I, pushed myself to learn to deal with it. And that's where the team dialogue came in, where we had to clarify those things. And it was a tough learning process. And I'm honest with you, that what took me, and I was the one that actually 
uh, was one of them that actually forced that approach, not even imagining what it did to people that didn't want it. But it took me a year, roughly, to get used to this no new dynamic. But after that, we reached a level of trust, transparency we could deal with. It was about to accept that this guy or this girl does it uh, different due to this and this and this. And it stopped those comparing uh, he is allowed to, she is not allowed to kind of dialogues. And that's what I mean. It, it's, it's a lot of extra miles we have to take. Now my, my shatter. Does it it looks time. like <laughs> now they, <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, is it okay or should no, I? No, 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 please. Let, let's just continue. Uh, but but I, I really find it very interesting. So just to, to, to wrap it up in, in, my, in my head and to, to, uh, that I understood it correctly. So you had this diary system in place uh, when you started to introduce a home office uh, in certain areas of your company. Uh, and uh, have they turned into Corona diaries or was this diary phase phased out and there are no diaries currently? Actually, um, you also asked the international question. Mm -hmm. So that example, because in the subsidiaries in different countries and cultures, the, the approach with home office is a wee bit different. Mm -hmm. If you have lots of people working in sales, of course, it's different as if you, as if you have a production place. So the most the biggest challenge we faced here in the headquarters. Mm -hmm. So lots of our subsidiaries were further advanced with certain elements because they by nature were forced due to the working circumstances they had. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had this, <laughs> lucky us, we had it almost finished this project before Corona came in. So some teams still have this kind of diary because they feel it's helpful, not mm -hmm. only for home office, which is, we just took that example, mm -hmm. but also for other approaches and uh, felt it helpful to actually learn more about my colleague. But what we now doing, and now we're really talking about today, because what I'm telling you now is happening this afternoon, because now we have the whole world in this situation. Now we have those subsidiaries, wherever we are in the world, being thrown in that situation and they they are facing now the coming back phase. So what we actually do, we have uh, within two days, we have uh, developed a program, worldwide program, to help them to do this onboarding with home office and mm -hmm. how does the new togetherness mm -hmm. looks like. And again, we defined and clarified a few key questions that we suggest uh, our employees and managers which is the same, <laughs> uh, not really, but it is, uh, to go through. And of course, we have not been talking about the whole information system so far in the, in the Corona thing, which I consider as being one of the most important elements, how information goes in those times. But uh, what I'm saying now, what's happening this afternoon, will be based on all what we have done uh, in that area before. Good or bad, we have done a lot of mistakes, believe me. Uh, but uh, so far, we still stood up and kept going. <laughs> but let me get back one more because I, I really find it interesting. And there's also a lot of research currently going on. That's maybe why I'm pressing you on that. And maybe also this is a question that maybe uh, the students might want to be interested in and have a look at. So to what degree transparency is a necessity or helpful or increasing transparency might be a way to uh, to deal with these challenges that uh, that arise due to corona so um, let, let me get back to, because uh, I'm really interested in how many people have access to these diaries so is this uh, just a team and supervisor level or can I look into diaries of of other teams so I guess this would also have consequences on how the diaries are written uh, and and, and what's actually a technology? Is this an intranet or how, how does it work? Uh, because I, I think that's a, a, pr a quite practical question that, that many uh, organizations uh, are currently facing. How do I organize it? How do I increase uh, transparency if I think that's a good thing? And, and of course, not in increasing it in, in general, as you said, uh, there's probably an optimal level of transparency, but this optimal level might also shift depending on whether people are increasingly in home office and, and that kind of stuff. Mm. 
as I said before, it's all about optimal transparency mm -hmm. and not maximal transparency. So we started in the small entities. So we said that the smallest entity where we expect this process running is on team level. So now, depending on the company, you've got maybe eight people or you have up to 20 or whatever. But on the smallest entity together with that group leader or manager, whatever there is, that's the smallest entity. And in this entity, we expect the dialogue about those diaries and the transparency that is bearable for this group of people. Mm -hmm. So also here we put the responsibility mm -hmm. on a smaller entity. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, that's important and no transparency to the rest of the company. Okay. Because then you would have had the finger pointing and the, ah, they do. And, and that's exactly what you don't want. Mm -hmm. And we put a second uh, level, we installed a second level in place, and that's amongst the, the managers. So we started with a few pilot court groups spread over the company because we said it's easy to do it all in IT or all in HR or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, we took an, a group, one or two groups from production. We took on purpose IT or engineering or whatever you've got in the company. And that was the first phase of the project. We put the leaders together to exchange their experiences as well. So have the leaders in their role learning as well what it means. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, like, <clears throat> excuse me, I quickly have to have a sip, sorry. <clears throat> that was the, the next kind of entity to learn. And so we slightly, slightly, as more confident people felt, expanded it. And it's not about the idea, top management needs exactly to know who does what. If that's the approach, then probably that's the wrong approach mm -hmm. to take. Uh, and that worked pretty well, I, I have to say. And what we're doing now is to installing more or less the same procedure again for the next phase due to the corona experience. Because I have learned a lot, the people have learned a lot, and it's, to me, probably one of the most important steps to take to talk about these learnings, exchange what we feel we should keep, uh, what was useful for whatever reasons, efficiency reasons or team reasons or whatever, and then come to an agreement together what's worthwhile keeping. Mm -hmm. And I'm 100% convinced that this will found the, the base uh, for more acceptance in the final execution. Mm -hmm. Maybe <clears throat> because we've not talked about an hour. Uh, really? and, uh, Holy moly. And, and, and I, I, but I think we, we, it has gotten ever more interesting. So I would like to, to continue, but maybe... Um, to not overwhelm also uh, my students and all the others who might uh, stumble across this video on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so you already, no, no, I, I really, I think it's, it's very interesting and, uh, and helpful. Uh, but, and, and you also mentioned that in this, uh, if I understood it correctly, that you're using this dialogue uh, oriented approach uh, to, uh, yeah, to draw lessons from your Corona learnings. <laughs> and I completely understand that that's uh, something that you have to do jointly together. That's not something that you draw the lessons, but nevertheless. So I'm, I'm to, in the end, I, I, I would want to ask you for your personal uh, opinion on what, what are your one or two main uh, learnings that you say, I want to, for me, maybe your own conduct, I wanna, I wanna even keep, or, or what are, what are to, to also end on a, maybe on a positive note, could you give, what are opportunities that you would say given acknowledging all the problems, the substantial uh, issues that probably are laying ahead uh, of you and of all of us, uh, given the upcoming economic downturn. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it's amazing how much more efficient one can be if he has to be. So that, that's probably one of them. I mean, things that we fiddled around maybe for months and years, I'll give you one example we developed an internal app within less than a week. 
because we had to reach our workforce with our information and we trapped ourselves that we fell into the old hierarchical structures immediately so the the information flow was always going through you know uh, the top down hierarchical lines and bear in mind we've got uh, thousands of people working in production so not everyone's got an email account mm -hmm. so we had to find a way how to reach them which was the obvious thing is if we reach them over the cell phones, uh, that is probably a way we can get the most directly to them. So we developed an app within four or five days and, and, and brought our information across. So learning, because that was your question from this example, the learning is um, I would like, I make a big point of how can we keep that efficiency when it's needed added by the social elements that of course are needed as well. And there's so many new things that if I go for to the tool base, for instance, or how the example, the recent example of last week, how Australia, we are just in a, in a process of redefining our strategy. Uh, they felt, they told me right from the, with all the excitement said you know what we found a new way every morning we call one hour reflecting going through the the strategy uh discussing one chapter then we go off then we work on it next day we meet again it's much it's much greater than sitting together for days and weeks and those kind of neat things i think it's not the big bangs it's it's those little things that i think are precious and should be should be kept uh, that's one thing and uh, you said I should finish it positively but I, I phrase it positively uh, you get to learn the people in those times um, and it's amazing and that's really positive what power can be freed all of a sudden or combined when it's necessary so how much do we underestimate that power under normal circumstances uh, or that potential that could be could be used and um, I have decided myself already started it with my own team that we put more focus on that how can we even better combine our strengths and weaknesses uh, we have found people that were expected to to shine in those times they disappeared completely mm -hmm. others not unexpectedly showed incredible positive sides and now the the challenging thing is to not judge it immediately but to first ask mm -hmm. why is it maybe the first one's wife is afraid because of the pandemic the kids wh whatever and i might not know but then draw in a fair i mean fair now mm -hmm. draw in a fair way uh, and take the consequences in a very positive way to not to get rid of people or to have others being whatever no the opposite to have them at the right spot with their talents where they feel where the fit is really there and um, yeah and then i could add a lot of others talking about procedures and forecasting systems etc etc but that's more on the on the factual side but that's true of course too we, um, we also have to make sure that we do not overwhelm ourselves mm -hmm. because uh, let's not forget we are in times of crisis we we have we're not through yet we do not know how it's going to end and um, yeah and the other thing is all those people that watch the people and make sure that the energy level is in balance because that's a bit in an uneven balance every once in a while in some of the cases yeah, you wanted um, to stop by a rather stop now. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's a, it's a nice. Uh, I'm also grateful that you, that you actually ended on the on the issue of we are in times of crisis, which is also the title of our course that we will feature this crazy. video in. So actually, uh, it seems to me you are already a YouTube professional because you know at the end of the YouTube video you ask your viewers to subscribe to the channel. Uh, and and uh, with your notion of times of crisis, you triggered that, of course. So um, 
very uh, thank you very much for your time and also for the details you were willing to share so transparently. Um, I, hope it, I, ho I hope it, it won't be too much of a of a competitive edge that you are uh, <laughs> that you are forgiving here. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, and so uh, yeah, let's uh, stop the recording here and uh, thank you again uh, for your time. Thank you, and sorry to the students that I challenged you that much, but that was the the issue, and it's a true picture where we are. Thank you very much for giving me the chance.